Hello and welcome back Earth Scientists for another lab video. You know, these videos are created for you, you know, to maybe you missed a class, maybe you need help learning more about these topics, maybe you just need a review. But that's what these are set aside for, to really provide you some tips, tricks, and to walk you page by page through the lab content in which we're covering in your lecture course as well. This lab in particular is Lab 9, Modeling Ocean Waves and Tides. So really the objectives of this lab are to learn you know, about longshore current, the different types of wave types. Uh, we're also going to talk also about uh, tides, as well as some coastal features, some very uh, easy to identify coastal features. So I'm excited to share this lab with you, and that being said, let's get started. All right, so let's begin. So this lab in particular, as I said before, is about modeling ocean waves and tides. So the first thing that kind of starts off this lab is discussing about, well, when you visit the beach and to build your little sandcastle, you know, what are some of the things that you notice? And you get to notice, obviously, the most, you know, the most predominant thing is the sand. And what's interesting about sand is that sand is not a descriptor of the material uh, the lithology or what geology is there. The sand is a term that's utilized uh, to represent a grain size. So when we're looking at beach sand, it can be made out of many, many different material types. But the key is that the word sand, you know, depicts the actual grain size itself. We also find that the coastal region is really the interface between the hydrosphere and the lithosphere. So it's a very dynamic you know, area that experiences a tremendous amount of erosion, transportation, and deposition. So as you continue to work through this, we end up learning more about the differences between summer and winter waves. We find that you know, waves themselves are, ener are you know, energy is born out in the middle of the ocean through storms, and then that you know, the energy is rippled away. But we find that summer, wa summer waves in particular are much smaller. Uh, winter waves are much more aggressive due to winter storms out in the ocean. You know, for myself, where I live here, specifically in the Pacific, uh, when we find that more of our winter storms offshore, uh, uh, you know, end up happening out during that time of year. So then moving forward, we can look at waves and coastlines. So the wave when a wave reaches shallower water, uh, the lower part of the wave is slowed by the ocean floor, but the upper part continues at the same speed until it essentially just topples over. So as an example, I've got one of these uh, little doohickeys. Maybe you remember one of these when you were a kid. You know, when we think about just you know, this diagram here that's depicting the characteristics of waves, this is a pretty intense diagram, but Nonetheless, we're going to be able to look at you know, wavelength, a crest, a trough, uh, even the amplitude itself. So if you know, here I have my little toy slinky, and when I go up and down, very little energy is needed. The high points are going to be considered the crests, so this shape. Low points are going to be troughs, and then the distance in between them, you know, the difference between height you know, of the crest and trough is considered the amplitude. And then when you're doing, you know, in a much grander scheme of things, uh, the distance between two crests is considered the wavelength, just like we do with sound uh, and as well as with light energy. Now, what's interesting about all of this is notice this depth. This depth is very important when discussing this because, you know, if I, very little energy is needed, you can see that I'm able to move the slinky up and down within the screen. But as I move my hands together, that represents essentially the, the, you know, the shortening of that, that space. <clears throat> you know, imagine, you know, I guess I should kind of notice what happens because of the slope. There's less space the closer towards the beach face you get. Well, if I move my hands together, I'm not adding any additional energy. Notice that it has less space to work in, so it gets more aggressive. And then at some point, when I get too close, it quits to work. It falls apart. The wave crashes. And that's essentially what we're able to observe in this diagram. So we have technically four different types of wave types, uh, but we're just going to be looking at these three, which are spilling, plunging, and surging. So things that you're going to be doing is using these diagrams on the side. You're going to observe and interpret and look at a couple different characteristics. Look at the size of the crests and the trough. Uh, what do we notice about the slope of the beach? These are all things that you will, you probably have already learned about in your uh, 
in your lectures within this course, but you know, start thinking about these things. Well, okay, well, this type of wave has a very horizontal beach slope. This one has a very steep beach slope. And try to describe those differences between these three types of waves. <clears throat> and if you can, if you can, also think about just you know how does gradient change during summer and winter. So what would you expect? Which of these waves would you be expecting to see you know in a summer month versus a winter month? All of which you know we've kind of described in that previous page before, uh, and bringing us down into here. So then we can move on to beach and coastline features. So again, remember this lab is just you know the lectures cover the main bulk of this. The labs just kind of apply it straight on. So there are some gaps in which you, you, if you're, this is new to you, you might need to check out some of the uh, earlier lecture content. But nonetheless, beach and coastline features all caused by erosion, transportation, and deposition. So it says here along the coastline you will find features created by deposition. Beaches are common uh, feature of coastlines that are made up of eroded material that have been transported from elsewhere and deposited along the shore. And for this activity, you can use your text, a, a smart device, dumb device if you have one of those, and your job is, is multifaceted. The first is you need to match. So you're going to, uh, first step, I click my little button here, uh, is to match each feature found uh, in the following diagram, and then to describe how that feature was developed. So I think the most efficient and, and the best way of doing this is to first define the feature. Once you define it, then you're going to be able to match it to its counterpart. Uh, I think by doing that, it makes it so much easier. So like as an example, when you get into, uh, you know, you've got you know, the near shore, the coast, like as an example, when I think of the word coast, I think of Pacific Coast Highway. And the coast is the region above the beach face, is the, you know, the zone, you know, farthest, you know, inland from the sea, which would be this here, letter A, this region from here outwards represents your coast. And so once you, you know, really decipher these terms, then you would learn, oh, okay, there is a difference between a beach, there is a difference between a coast, or the back shore, or a sandbar, or a beach berm. Beach berms and sandbars are berms or bars of sand, but their location is what differentiates them from one another. So again, first you're going to define, then you're going to match it. However you want to match it is up to you, uh, but those are the big pieces there. Again, I would define it first then to see which diagram best fits. I'm going to choose a different color just for the moment. So the way this also works is like letter C. Letter C is anything in between this space going all the way down. So all of this area is part of C. Um, same thing with you know, letter I is just this region here, right? Um, H is just this space in here. J might be this one thing here, right? Uh, and F represents the whole area. So you really look at how those lines are drawn on that landscape. And so then, and then, that wraps up part A. So let's start part B, tides and the tide omatic. All right, so welcome to part B, tides and the tide omatic. So in most places on Earth where the ocean meets the land, there are two highs and two low tides each day. This tide omatic will show the equilibrium theory of tides, showing why there are two tide cycles per day and why the heights of these tides can change over the course of a month, and also why the tides occur about an hour later each day. So uh, you'll read through this portion of the lab um, I did provide some additional text, but the key is this link here. So normally in a face-to-face -face class, we would have made a title matic, uh, but in this case, you're going to click this video. It's going to open up a uh, a YouTube video, <laughs> sorry, and you're going to get an image, and it's going to be a video. I'm going to share the image right here just for a moment. Uh, it'll look something kind of like this. And the purpose of this is that this is the tide omatic. So I have a piece of paper, uh, this little bubble, I'm going to move the earth onto that spot, the sun, and then this blue, the blue part here is on a piece of plastic. The blue represents the moon. So notice that yes, the moon and the sun are of significant difference in, in distance, right? But the moon is much closer, so it does have a greater pull. So these bubbles that are on here, these bubbles represent ocean water. It's weird to imagine, but just for our purposes here, you have the lithosphere, the earth, the rock, and then the hydrosphere is on top. And just think that it, you know, as the moon, as it's pulling material, you know, from, because gravity of the moon itself, 
um, it can't move really the rock. What it's moving is the water. The water is very buoyant. It's just like those toys when you squeeze them as a kid, you squeeze them and then the water or the whatever's in it would get split between either sides. So that's what happens. So what ends, what ends up happening in this activity is it will put the earth on this spot and we're gonna be able to do a couple different things. One is we're gonna be able to see what happens as we move the moon around the earth. And where does this bubble? Because notice because of this space right here, drop right here, I'll pick red. So, if, you know, if this dot is, you know, if the Earth is going to go on that dot right there, oops. Um, but we're going to be able to, oh, hold on one second, let me move it, there we go. I guess I, I can't doodle on it if I'm off of the, uh, the area. So the Earth goes right in here, so that makes sense. Um, and then what we're going to notice here is that the space, look at how big the space is because of the moon. This bubble will spin when you hit play. The yellow represents the space because of the sun. So these would be super high tides because you have both the power of the moon and the sun pooling the water. So both sides of the earth would be experiencing super high and in these areas here would be experiencing super low tides. When you move the moon away from the sun, it helps to diminish that pool and it creates normal tides. Uh, you know, and then we'll learn more about that in, in other lectures, talking about spring tides, neap tides, ebb tides, they have special names. But what's interesting about this process, uh, using the Tidomatic, I go in order of the lab itself in the video, is it talks about, okay, well, we're just dealing specifically with the moon and the earth and the sun is stationary. But we know that the, you know, well, the sun obviously is stationary, but you know, the moon goes around uh, the earth, but also the earth goes around the sun. So that changes our tides. So that's why tides can be very, very complicated to calculate because we're not dealing with just the motion of one, of the moon. We're also looking at our rotation around the sun, which then creates different types of tides at different times of year, which we're able to predict because we're able to model it out. So this activity, activity will take you step by step saying, okay, you know, you know, it says to do the movement, but the video goes in order where I actually do the movement for you so you can observe and interpret and write in your answers. So that will how you're going to calculate and solve part B, the, the tides and the tidomatic. Again, I explain much more in the video when you click this link uh, on the PDF here. Uh, otherwise, I can share the link here boop, for that video so you can check that out uh, when you're working on this. But the tidomatic is a really fun activity to see. You know, okay, we understand how tides work, and we do have high tides, low tides, super high, super low, uh, but, but why? And this is really a very simple, uh, basic introduction to the why part of it, which is pretty cool. All right, so that being said, that wraps up part B. Then we'll move on to part C, which is called the beach, a river of sand. All right. Last part, part C, The Beach, A River of Sand. I love this film. So you can see, you can obviously Google the name here. Uh, there's also the hyperlink uh, in the PDF that you can access. But The Beach, A River of Sand is a film from the 1960s. And it's a fantastic film because what they've done is they show everything we've talked about so far in this lab and some of the things we'll talk about in the next one, uh, not just using imagery, but my favorite part of it is they actually use miniatures, they use wave tanks, which we at the college that I teach at, we have a full size wave tank where you can build small models, you put your sand and you, you know, the machine paddles back and forth and makes the waves so we can look at the erosion, transportation, and deposition occurring. It's about a 20 minute video which you can certainly speed up a little bit when you're watching, but this is a fill in the blank activity that goes with the film. The film is very important to watch, it's 20 minutes of your time, it's not a big deal. Uh, but it is a big deal in the sense that it provides a lot of hands-on and visual terms of which we've already used and which you might find that maybe some of your answers might not be right in some of those diagrams. Uh, but you're know, learning about some of these different features that we will continue to talk about in the next lab as well. But it's a great way to really you know, fully encompass that concept and content of what's happening at the longshore current. Why do we have developments of spits? How do beaches work? What about tides? What about winter waves versus summer waves? What about a breaker wave? How does that, you know, so, you know, everything up to this point, we've pretty much used, you know, hands-on type, you know, details. This video brings, you know, kind of full circle the whole thing by using really great imagery that is just truly timeless. So that's 
very simple as you can see it's just a handful of questions uh, lucky for you um, you know they should be in order of the film so you just kind of listen to it as you go through uh, and answer some of it's just a, a circle some of it might be a word or two but it's just really to make sure you're paying attention uh, to the film itself and to make sure you really observe and interpret the terms uh, the features and the landscapes that are seen in that all right so that wraps up part C uh, if you have any questions don't forget to comment below I do appreciate uh, your time uh, and working through this lab also in the uh, description of this lab, you'll see that there's a link to all the additional labs in case this might be something that you could use for your own classes or you might want to share it along. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe if you haven't done so. And that being said, we'll talk soon.